Good morning to all of you, and I would like to thank uh, um, the organizers of uh, this wonderful international meeting to ask me to talk about growth in type 1 diabetic children. Now, since I'm a pediatric endocrinologist and growth is an integral part of every child, and it's one of the best biological indicators of how well you treat any disorder, not only diabetes. Any disease that you treat is going to have an impact on growth, and growth is one of the best parameters to know how well or badly you manage the disease. So starting with some facts about growth in diabetic children is that at the time of diagnosis of type 1 diabetes, when we see them at presentation, we see them very slim. However, the fact is that they, when they develop diabetes, they actually have a slightly higher BMI than rest of the population. So there is some element of higher weight when it comes to etiopathogenesis of diabetes in pediatric population. Similarly, when they have got type 1 diabetes and the way we administer insulin, which is subcutaneous and doesn't get into the portal vein, and as some of you may know that the main source of IGF-1 is liver and that's not where the insulin is going, these children do develop abnormalities of growth hormone and IGF-1 axis. Similarly, bioavailability and bioactivity of IGF-1 in type 1 diabetic children is abnormal. And there is high circulating insulin, growth hormone hypersecretion, and resistance to IGF-1 has also been implicated in the pathogenesis of polycystic ovary syndrome, which is more common in type 1 adolescent girls. So what has been observed when it comes to growth in diabetic children? See, almost all studies have shown that it's related to diabetes control. And you just heard my previous speaker telling you about the generally achieved HbA1c levels in the United States. And in India, since the monitoring facilities are less, our HbA1c's are even higher. And it's, the growth is directly connected to your metabolic control. So poor growth velocity, especially in the pubertal years, is very common in type 1 children, which eventually leads to short stature. Delayed puberty is almost universal. Having said that, I'll show you a couple of studies that we have done. We haven't observed it in the group with basal bolus therapy with an HbA1c which is 8 or less than that. And the most severe form that we all learned is the Moriak syndrome as shown in this particular child. Extreme short stature, very poor glycemic control, hepatomegaly, glycogen laden liver. We hope we don't see this picture anymore. So what is the mechanism of growth failure in type 1 diabetes? So it's a combination of multiple factors. What you have is chronic disease, glucotoxicity. I mentioned about growth hormone axis abnormalities, delayed puberty repeated infections and diabetic ketoacidosis, also associated autoimmune disease. See, it's very easy to forget about other disorders when you're only focusing on type 1 diabetes. There are a lot of autoimmune and other disease which eventually develop in a child with type 1 diabetes. And a couple of clear cases that I'll show will actually highlight it further. And of course then, if it's poorly managed for years, the complications come which further compromise growth. So here's my first case. You have an eight-year-old girl who was diagnosed to be diabetic at six and a half years and is on basal bolus regime. Fair diabetic control, HbA1c around 8%. Growth velocity, normal so far. At nine years, plotting her growth on the chart shows a very low growth velocity. Remember, growth velocity in a child is usually five centimeters a year, between third year to puberty. Before third year, it is much faster, and in puberty, it's again fast. So this is clearly a low growth velocity. So what are the possibilities? Poor diabetic control, hypothyroidism, celiac disease. So she was found to be hypothyroid and was treated. Started growing well again. At the age of 11, 
her growth was static and she had weight loss. What are the possibilities? Again, poor control, celiac disease, other autoimmune disease developing, not taking her thyroid medication properly, which she was. She was found to be TTGIJ positive and was proven to have celiac disease. And if you look at her growth chart, see this is where I, I would like all of you to use growth charts if you look after a, children with, a child with type 1 diabetes. See here is the story of what's happening. Fair metabolic control growing well. Static growth in terms of height, but the weight again continues, so that's hypothyroidism. Then corrected hypothyroidism grew normally. Again, there is weight loss and static height, celiac disease developing. So literally, this is a graph of your health and disease in a kid who already has type 1 diabetes. So unless you plot growth in type 1, you're not going to suspect a disorder that is developing. So please, please, please monitor growth and plot it on a growth chart. So this is where hypothyroidism developed, this is where static height due to celiac disease. So maintaining a growth chart for every diabetic child is a must and will pick up many disorders quite early before they are too late. And I, I was delighted to see Dr. Archana in one of her slides showing that every child's growth is plotted. Thank you. Case two, six-year-old boy, hyperglycemia, random sugar 330, symptoms of diabetes, normal growth parameters. A year later, he complains of sticky oily stools and exocrine pancreatic deficiencies also found. His growth, however, has been absolutely static. Something shocking, not even a millimeter of growth in a year. After a few days, he develops peculiar hypertrichotic patches on his skin and deafness follows two years later. So when you have diabetes and deafness, you would think of Didmold or similar syndromes. That's the kind of skin patches that he had, woody, hypertrichotic patches on both legs as well as symmetrical patches around the spine. And look at his growth over the years. I've never seen anything like this before. Unfortunately, this child succumbed only last week. So no growth, exocrine pancreatic deficiency, deafness. So he had H syndrome, hyperpigmented hypertrichotic patches, hearing defect, hyperglycemia, height deficit, heart disease, exocrine pancreatic deficiency. And we, we did a genetic workup on this and he was found to have a novel mutation uh, for H syndrome. So these are extreme cases. But see, here was a kid who was telling you on the growth chart that this is not a typical type 1 diabetic. This is something else. And this is not type 1 diabetes, this is just hyperglycemia. And the level of hyperglycemia and H syndrome can really vary. So now I'll move on to uh, some of the studies that we have done. And the only studies that I could find in literature on growth in diabetes is that all in of medical sciences years ago have said that the frequency of growth disorder was 11 to 14 percent. And 2006, Dr. Anju Virmani's data from her clinic, which is part of the ICMR registry, shows that 16% of her patients had growth retardation. Now this paper we published in the Indian Journal of Endocrinology and Metabolism on growth status of children and adolescents with type 1 diabetes. So the first study that I am showing you is just looking at the growth. And the second one is looking at the growth velocity. So what we have done is this is a retrospective cross-sectional case control study Study compares growth parameters of diabetic children with age and gender matched healthy controls. We looked at 125 diabetic children, 50 boys, age and gender matched, same number of controls. All subjects underwent anthropometric measurements and these are for, for people who are not in pediatrics. In children, we look at the growth parameters as Z score. Z score tells you how far away you are from the mean of the population being studied. So these are height age Z score, weight age Z scores, and body mass index Z scores for Indian population were calculated. Diabetes control was evaluated by measuring glycosylated hemoglobin and daily sugar records. So what you see here is that these are the diabetic children and these are the controls. And I would like to draw your attention to the height age Z score. Anything that is closer to zero is normal. So children who are not diabetic are almost normal. Minus 0.1 is nearly zero and minus 0.5 for weight. However, diabetic children, both boys and girls, are way below 
the normal. Their Z scores are lower, so they're shorter and lighter. The same thing I have shown as a graph. However, for people who are not used to looking at Z scores, and pardon me if this is too simplified, but closer to the zero means better performance. So normal children controls have much better Z scores as compared to the poor diabetic kids. Then this table is showing you comparison of growth parameters between diabetic children according to the insulin regime. Now we always say that the only way you manage type 1 diabetes is basal bolus or continuous subcutaneous insulin pump therapy, which in India is often not possible and we always have a large proportion of children who are on the split mix regime. So this is conventional or split mix versus the intensive regime and as you can see that children who are in the basal bolus regime have better Z scores as compared to those on split mix. So better metabolic control, better growth parameters. So this study told us that height and weight parameters of diabetic children are significantly lower. Children on both insulin regimes are shorter, but those who are on basal bolus are performing better than those on split mix. Height of children who were diagnosed below the age of three years were most severely affected. So longer is the duration of the disease and younger is the age of onset, worse is the growth. Those diagnosed after puberty were comparable. So they have almost gone through the process of growth and then developed diabetes. So that's understandable. Children diagnosed at younger age need more attention to optimize growth. And this is the second study where we looked at longitudinal growth in children and adolescents for a period of three and a half years with type 1 diabetes. So we have growth velocity parameters in this. And again, this table shows you that longitudinal growth in children, mean duration is 3.3 years. And what we have here is again, this is the baseline data showing you the height age Z score, weight age Z score. And understandably, these children are shorter and lighter at the onset of, um, uh, onset of the trial and their HbA1c mean is 8.8. .8. And what we found is 35% children had low growth velocity. So nearly a third are growing slowly. Disease duration and HbA1c affected the height velocity. So longer is the duration, worse is the HbA1c, worse is the growth velocity. Children on basal bolus had higher growth velocity as compared to split mixed, which is statistically significant. Children diagnosed before five years of age had lowest height velocity. And of the children who reached final height, nearly half were shorter than their mid-parental target height. So they remained short adults. So we concluded from this study is that children diagnosed with type 1 diabetes at younger age are at a higher risk of long-term growth failure, reduced final height. There's further worsening with poor metabolic control and basal bolus treatment shows better growth outcome than split mix. Now, I'm going to finish early and give you some time. So, I want you to look at these growth charts, which are the Indian Academy of Pediatrics growth charts. These are downloadable free of cost from the website of Indian Academy of Pediatrics. And I urge you all to please download them and use them. There is an application which is available free again on your Android as well as um, iPhones. You just have to type IAP growth chart and please use it for people who are very good with their mobile phones. You can actually get a longitudinal growth chart plotted on the application also, so please use it. So to summarize what I said, please measure height and weight at every contact or at least three to six monthly in children with type 1 diabetes. I would go on to say in every child who is under your care, but certainly in type 1 children. Plot these on the Indian Academy of Pediatrics growth chart. Check the onset and progress of puberty very carefully because it's often delayed. And during puberty, the metabolic control is worse. You saw that in the last speaker slide, the HbA1c is worse between nine years to 18 years. Growth faltering needs investigations to rule out hypothyroidism, celiac disease, disorders of puberty, other autoimmune disease, and chronic complications of type one. Growth is better when metabolic control is better. So basal bolus therapy is certainly the preferred therapy in type 1 and not split mix. 
I know that there are times when you have no choice, but try, try your best to give the basal bolus. Poor growth outcome seems associated with poor metabolic control, younger age at diagnosis, and longer duration of disease. For those of you who are into pediatric endocrinology, we have recently published a textbook of IAP textbook on pediatric endocrinology, and there is a large section on type 1 diabetes on that. So you can get this book on Amazon or from the, from the publisher's website. Thank you for your attention.